Hello, I'm Rob Califf, and I want to welcome you back to another um, chapter of Life and Times of Famous Cardiologists. And as all of you know, uh, these interviews for me are a very special thing because I believe people are motivated by other individuals who do extraordinary things. And having the chance to talk about what motivates them and what they've accomplished, but maybe more importantly, what they see in the future um, is really important to me, and I hope you enjoy it too. So I'm privileged today to have Nanette Wenger joining me. Nanette, Hello. I've had the chance to watch and interact with over the course of many years in our southern venue of between Atlanta and uh, Durham. Welcome. Thank you. I like to start these by going way back to the beginning of a person. And can you tell us a little bit about um, your family and wh where you grew up? Yes, my parents were immigrants from Europe. Uh, I grew up in New York City, but my parents were very interesting people in that they believed and taught that their daughters could do anything that they wanted, and they really never saw any gender boundaries or barriers. And the concept was education was paramount, and it was, it was a broad-based education. I lived in the museums, I lived uh, in the uh, music theaters, but education was paramount, and then you decided where your passion was, and you followed it. Now, which country in Europe were they from? They were from Russia. And as a matter of fact, my parents grew up in the same small town, but didn't know each other. My father was uh, a friend, actually, of my mother's oldest sister, and they did not reacquaint until both of them were in the U.S. Wow, that's, that's uh, fascinating. And um, what, what kind of work did they do? My father uh, worked basically for uh, a group that worked with the Joint Distribution Committee, and much of his early activities were involved with helping rescue uh, the Jews from the uh, Hitler invasion and resettle them. And subsequently, he uh, worked with many of the Jewish organizations in terms of identifying refugees and helping resettle them in the US. My mother was a homemaker, but she was a fantastic artist. And before she married, she drew covers for the magazine that was essentially the antecedent of Vogue. It was a Godey's Ladies book. So she was a fabulous artist and actually never did anything subsequent to her marriage other than volunteer work in the community. She probably did that quite well, I would imagine, based on what you said. Oh, she, she was a fabulous artist, but I think I can't paint the side of a barn. I think it skipped a generation, and one of my daughters is quite artistically talented. Now, you only had sisters? You didn't have any brothers? I had one sister, that's it. And what did she end up doing? My sister is an historian and taught history uh, at the University of Alabama in uh, Huntsville for all of her career. You both ended up going south. Why did that happen? Well, at that time, my fiance joined the newly developing full-time faculty at the Emory University School of Medicine came right out of fellowship to be chief of gastroenterology at the Atlanta VA. And I agreed as a good bride-to-be that I would try it for one year. Well, it stretched out to half a century, and Atlanta has been very good to both of us. Gee. And so I'm just trying to go back now to New York, and you're uh, there with your sister. Did, did your father talk about his work um, around the dinner table? What, what were the conversations like? Well, there, there was a great deal of, of conversation, and there was also some conversation about medicine as well, because my father's oldest sister was a surgeon. She was a surgeon in Moscow, so that when people ask uh, our daughters, two of whom are physicians, what does it feel like to be a woman physician? Well, they're the third generation of women physicians uh, in the family. That's quite unusual. Did, when did you decide you wanted to be a doctor? I think quite early on. When I was in high school, I was fascinated with science. When I was in college, there was a pre-medical major, which was quite unusual because it entailed no minor. And it gave you the prerequisites 
for medical school and then allowed you to take a whole variety of other courses that otherwise would have been impossible with a conventional major or minor. And I must admit there was a period of time when I was very much tempted to do constitutional law because I had a woman who was a phenomenal professor of constitutional law and it just intrigued me, which is why I follow many of these constitutional debates with much, much interest and a little bit of background information. Was there a corresponding uh, mentor or inspirational figure on the medical side that drew you into it? or? I had a number of cousins who were physicians, even though my parents were not, and they just seemed to enjoy what they did, and one of them was involved in, in teaching of house staff, so I, I heard about it a fair bit. And where did you go to college? I went to college at Hunter College in New York City. So you really were a city person. Well, we, we lived on the island, and I, I commuted. I went to the Hunter College High School as well. So this was an almost one hour commute each way daily, both for high school and for college. But uh, that was just part of what people anticipated being able to do if you wanted to go to school in the city. And then medical school was where? Medical school was at Harvard. What was that? Was that a big change to go from being in the city? Um... Well, it, it was fascinating because mine was the sixth class of women at the Harvard Medical School. And as you may know, women were not put into the university charter until there was a 10-year probationary experience with them. I didn't know that. And at the end of my class's graduation, the 10 years of probation ended so that women were in the university charter. But at the time, the men lived in dormitories under house rules. And the women, because we were not in the charter, we weren't given housing, so we lived in apartments in town. It was totally oh, you had a special the benefit. It though. was totally the converse of what you might anticipate. But me medical school, when people say, "Well, what was it like?" Well, it was fabulous. It was such a learning experience, and my classmates were enormously supportive. Uh, now, now, what year did you enter medical school? Fifty-four. Fifty-four. So, who was president then? I'm not sure I can even tell you going through all of the things, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the atmosphere in school was just one of learning and of nurturing the students. See, the reason, the reason I asked you about the president is that, um, you know, I think to a lot of us, you know, I was born in 51. Yeah. And a lot of people look back at the 50s as sort of a dreamlike time for America where everything was possible. You know, well, I the, thought you were asking about the president of Harvard. No, <laughs> no, 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 the president of the United States. Uh, no, it, it really wasn't a totally dreamlike period because when, when school was over and when training began, et cetera, and there was consideration of, of the war, the women were almost asked not to apply for positions at the NIH ah. because we were not subject to the draft and the men who went to the NIH were exempted from the draft. So essentially, it was not looked at as ideal for the women to consider going to NIH, but rather to go to other residency and training programs. So you finished uh, medical school, and where did, where did you go for your internship? I, I went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Back to New York. Back to New York, and remember, this was before the Mount Sinai Hospital had a medical school. So all of the training went to the house staff. And this was essentially when the giants roamed the halls of the Mount Sinai Hospital. Bela Schick was one of the attendings in pediatrics. Alan Gutmacher in obstetrics and gynecology. So uh, it, it, they were just unbelievable people. Simon Dack, was there in cardiology? Uh, well, Arthur Master was to, to Arthur Master us. was there. I think I'd done more Master two-step tests than almost <laughs> anyone around. And of course, my mentor was Charlie Friedberg, who right. was arguably one of the finest clinical cardiologists of that era. Simon Dack is a name that was very meaningful to the American College of Cardiology and other. Um, 
sort of established groups. What was he like? Simon Dack was a wonderful teacher and a wonderful electrocardiographer. And he, again, he took care of his house officers. Remember, these were the days when we worked every other night and every other weekend, which is why we were called house officers. We basically lived at the hospital. But the idea was that this was fun, that this was a learning experience. Uh, we were all involved in doing some kind of research, even during our training. And at the end of the cardiology fellowship, we had to have a published paper before we received training. So that my first manuscript was a paper published actually in the, in the Green Journal, a paper on coronary embolism. And we had to do all the typing by ourselves. And I'm not a typist. <laughs> and redid those references again and again. No erasable bond paper, no computers, no that, nothing. But we, we had the resources of one of the finest libraries in the country at the Mount Sinai Hospital. And I was able to look at some of the non-English references because between my parents, they could translate most of what was there for me. So Friedberg then was really the sort of the master teacher. And was, was he your mentor? Or? Very much so. I was the first fellow when he took over. So I was the first fellow in his program. And he was such an amazing teacher. He taught as well as he wrote. And some of the things that he did and described were memorable. And to this day, when I make rounds and when we talk about a problem, I can hear him talking. And probably one of the best analogies, and I've said it again and again to my house staff, is talking about the patient with untreated mitral stenosis. And he said what the lifestyle is like for these people over time is like the old wind-up clocks that are winding down. And that is such a phenomenal description of the history that you should garner from a patient with untreated mitral stenosis. So in the midst of all this, you must have uh, been going out dating. When did, when did you meet your uh, husband? Well, actually, our fathers was, were friends. It's not ah. truly an arranged marriage, but our fathers introduced us. And we had dated on and off for a number of years. And as I was finishing up at Sinai, I had my plans. I was going to uh, spend a year in Europe. I was going to spend six months at the Karolinska and six months with Paul Wood, and then come back to Sinai and join Dr. Friedberg uh, in his practice. And then I became engaged and decided to come to Atlanta. And it really changed my total orientation and total view. Remember, I had grown up in New York and Boston in a completely open and actually functionally integrated group. And I had friends with diverse backgrounds and I came to a completely segregated South. That must have been quite a shock. It, it, was, a, it was a cultural shock. And I think had I not been in the university with like-minded people, I'm not sure either of us would have stayed. But within the university, we found the group of people who were interested in keeping the schools open, who believed that integration could and should be done, and we watched a peaceful revolution take place. But I also learned something about the values and the value systems of some of our patients. Remember that my entire career at Emory was at the public hospital at Grady Memorial Hospital, which is an indigent care hospital in the center of the city. And I learned so much about the patients. I learned how much they valued family and friends and in what high regard they took their medical caregivers. I learned how they volunteered to help us teach generations of physicians. Probably half of the physicians practicing in Georgia today have gone through our training program. And then they taught me something else, actually, that I, I mentioned in my Herrick lecture last evening. They taught me that the designation of honey or sweetie, 
or Lady Doc, which was the way I was addressed, was probably much more of an indication of respect and admiration than was a university title. But uh, these were patients who participated in our research studies from the beginning on, from the studies of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors that form the basis of what we do to the thrombolytic studies, and then more recently in the, all the women's hormone studies. So these are the patients who contributed to medicine as we know it today and uh, have a tremendous amount of respect for patients who participate in trials. I want to come back to that, but I also wanted to just pick your brain about women in cardiology. So, um, as you know, um, the proportion of women in cardiology is almost the lowest proportion of any specialty. Urology, I think, is, has a lower proportion of women, but not that many women go into cardiology. Did you think about that when you were deciding what to do? And that was really never a variable because when I was in medical school, it was almost the golden age of cardiology. We had Alex Natus over at Children's Hospital that was just beginning to work on congenital heart disease. Lou Dexter was, was at the Brigham uh, in, in the cath lab. Uh, and we were beginning to see the first cardiac surgery procedures being done. It was almost magic. The cardiac catheterization laboratory was just opening up. And we were beginning to see the physiologic basis and beginning to see interventions that were based on what we learned in the basic science laboratory. So it was, it was just a wonderful time to be in cardiology and a wonderful time subsequently to be able to explore things. So really no, you I just never found thought it, about it. You just found it exciting and that's it, what you it did. Was, it was intellectually challenging and there were so many frontiers. That, that was probably the most exciting part about it. Oh, and if you fast forward to now in women in cardiology, what we still have a lower proportion of women going into cardiology when over oh. half of medical students are well, female. We're doing better. We are trying to talk to the women that are in the internal medicine residency programs and before. And if you look at the percentage of women that are fellows in training now, it is increasing incrementally and they will become the cardiologists of the future. And we see a large number of women in some of the very demanding specialties, in heart failure, in electrophysiology, in intervention. So we're seeing women, the, the, the limitation is we're not seeing that many women in cardiac surgery. But we're seeing women in all aspects of cardiology, and we're seeing women not only surviving, but thriving. So you think the tables have turned and- uh, They're turning. Yeah. Um, so then if we go back to uh, your experience in Atlanta, what was it like socially um, to arrive in Atlanta from New York and, and Boston? You had your friends in the university. What about outside the university? Well, remember that my family has a tradition of volunteerism. So I became very much involved in some of the uh, organizations in the community and made a large number of friends there. And I was very much involved in many of the community organizations and president of a number of them over, over the years. So I had a large number of friends outside of the university community. But working was most unusual for any Southern woman in the 1960s. And it took a while until people realized they wanted to know, you know, why are you going to work? Your husband obviously has a good job. You have a beautiful home. You have servants. Why are you working? And the comment was that I just enjoy what I do and I love to go to work. And subsequently, many of my friends who about a decade later also saw the light and went back to school and did work, uh, began to realize that it was appropriate for a Southern woman who did not have to work to have a career. And I was involved in starting uh, the Atlanta Women's Network because there were an emerging number of women in business, in the arts, uh, in industry, in the professions, and we started a networking group that was the predecessor of many of the other groups in the community so that we could contact each other and form a social support network for each other. 
That's fascinating. You know, I, I saw a piece of data, and the, you may not have heard this yet, but you may have already heard about it. Um, it's a really interesting group at Harvard now, which is using um, social networking analysis to look at the careers of uh, a lot of issues in career development, but men and women in academic medicine was particularly interesting because what they found surprisingly to me was that men in academic medicine had larger networks when you look at the table of co-authors and the way they're all interconnected than women did. Whereas I think in regular life, women have larger social networks typically than men do. Does that surprise you? Well, there were relatively fewer women with whom to have a social network. But the women are enormously supportive of each other. And more and more, as we have women in our training programs, and you know, Emory has been outstanding for the number of women in the training program. And I started the girls' night out for, the, uh, for our trainees that we did for a number of years. And as a matter of fact, about, I think it's two or three years ago, we had 15 women cardiology fellows. And they were just so excited at this mass that they, they got together and took me out to dinner to celebrate <laughs> the girls' night out. Now, Grady Hospital at that time, I've had the fun of watching Grady Hospital in its different eras, but um, what was it like when you first arrived? And, and could you say a little bit about how it's evolved over all these well, years? Well, Grady was a strictly segregated hospital, including, if you remember the Porgy and Bess analogy, two separate blood banks because it was a criminal offense to mix blood. And we saw as the hospital built and as the South emerged from segregation, we saw an integrated hospital. Uh, we, it was a learning curve for everyone, for the patients, for the staff, and for the faculty. And I think today I consider Grady to be virtually the flagship of public hospitals in America. And when people talk about the Emory University School of Medicine and its training program, the first breath is Grady Hospital because this is where so many of our students and house staff got their training, got their experience in patient care, got their supervision that taught them how to make decisions but with sufficient supervision that there was safety. Now, Recently, Grady went through a really rough time, right, that where finances um, Well, the, we, we had some problems with the political leadership of the hospital. And more recently, it has become a 501c3 corporation. And we have a board of directors that is stellar. And the level of transparency would have been impossible to believe a decade ago. And because of that, we have attracted major capital funding from the Atlanta community, not for the running of the hospital, but for the renovation. We have a brand new trauma center. We have a brand new stroke center. Uh, we have a huge cancer center. Uh, we totally redid outpatient cardiology and just have money in the bank that we're totally going to do inpatient cardiology. So what we've done is the physical plant of the hospital has advanced to the point where it matches the quality of the care. And it is very exciting to me to see patients being helicoptered in to the public hospital in Atlanta for specialty care that's not available elsewhere. You know, we've always had a burn center that had international recognition. But this is an area that I think is a major area of promise. It is a major area where I think we will continue to do clinical research, where we will continue to do the teaching and training of the doctors who will take care of the next generation. So what do you think about the training now? You mentioned every other night on call, living in the hospital. Now it's well, quite I've, different, well, isn't it? Well, I, I have some concerns, and I've, I've voiced them to many people. Uh, unfortunately, I think that we have overreached the balance between the amount of rest that's required and the amount of value that is learned from following a critically ill patient from admission on through. I think there are too many transitions, there are too many handovers, and we probably will have to get back to a balance where physicians 
don't spend more time on their work hours than they do on their patients' laboratory data. Uh, I really want to see physicians comfortable, not with shift work, but with the continuing care of a patient and learning what they will anticipate when they go out into practice in the real world. I want them to be able to take ownership of the patient and responsibility and not hand that over. Well, let me ask you, I guess you, you uh, stimulated a I want, want to ask a somewhat provocative question, and it relates to the other part of things. So I can I can fully accept having been a coronary care unit person myself. What you say, and I, I identify with it, and the need for continuity and lack of handoffs in a complicated situation. But so much of one's health we now know is determined by what happens um, in real life outside the hospital. And if you look at America and Atlanta, or Durham's the same way, in the South especially, the disparities in health outcomes are just dramatic, and they're not narrowing the way people thought they would. I mean, black men in Durham, North Carolina, have an average lifespan le more than 10 years shorter than white women, for example. I know it's the same in Atlanta. And it, it seems like caring, uh, helping in that situation as a physician involves a whole different set of skills. I'm sort of interested in how you think about that as you're, because you're seeing such a high proportion actually of people in the southeast who are coming through and training, you know, end up going through Grady at one point or another. Well, again, we can't focus all of medical care in the hospital. It has to be extended out into the community. And much of what we have to do is to address information, education and access to care. And the problem is that the, just looking at the cardiac area, the people with the highest burdens of disease and the highest risks are the underserved population. They are the racial and ethnic minorities, and we have to find a way to get the information out to these individuals so that they know something about symptoms, they know something about disease. Remember, Atlanta is a melting pot and we have a large number of minority communities. We have a large community from Southeast Asia, we have an Oriental community, we have a Middle Eastern community, and each of these communities comes to medicine with its own cultural values. For many, prevention is almost an anathema because for many, you only take care of problems when they occur rather than anticipating them and preventing them. So you, it's a cultural change to say that you have to do something about a problem that is not existing at the moment. And this is what we have to do with our community, and therefore the responsibility, I think, of the hospital and for us as a university is a responsibility of outreach to the community. We do a little bit of it via an international clinic, but certainly not as much. And our neighborhood health centers will have to take increasing responsibility in terms of contacting people who are ostensibly well. I hope that in some of what we're doing in a women's program that I'm planning for the university is that we begin to develop a database within the community to say what are community risks, because it's not a global Atlanta community, it's a community of subpopulations. And, and where within these subpopulations does the risk exist? We will have to do what we did in the early years of hypertension control, where we had community workers and community advocates who knew the community, who knew the cultural mores, who knew the access. And this is where we have to do the work. I, I have not been excited by as many things in recent years as by the recent UN summit in September, focusing on non-communicable diseases as a major health problem. And cardiovascular is obviously at the top of these. And the emphasis is on prevention. And prevention has to start in the community to keep the people out of the hospital. I guess the, the Briefly, uh, briefly, I'm interested in your view of whether the traditional training programs we currently have are, are um, training doctors who can operate in the environment that you're describing for prevention. Seems like they I, learn a lot about technical procedures and critical illness, but. Well, the ballot is still out on that, but at Emory, we've started a new curriculum 
and the first class just graduated with the new curriculum where patients are introduced into the exposure of the medical students within the first year where there is a lot of time for independent investigation for research where students are encouraged to go outside the classroom the hospital and do the work so I expect that if we help them ask the appropriate questions that they will begin to learn about community both local and national and global and will become medical citizens of a global environment that is our emphasis that was the emphasis in developing the curriculum in stimulating intellectual curiosity and this is really the only way that we are going to be able to train the physicians of the future uh, that really sounds exciting i just have a couple of final questions it's been fascinating never enough time in these um, interviews your family uh, when i walked in you were talking about your uh, granddaughter i think your daughter mm -hmm. and, yeah um, your family obviously played a major role um, in what you've done. Could you say a little bit about how you balance the family and professional obligations? Well, again, balance is, is relative. And what I did and what I recommend to all of the trainees with whom I interact is save your valuable time for the th areas where you're needed most, and that is your family. Our family suppers, dinners, were blocked out time. We always spent that time together. And I've said that you perhaps have to do more planning for family outings than you do for a grand round session. Because if you miss a ballet recital, uh, a little league game, or what have you, you may never get the opportunity to do it until you're a grandparent. So this becomes a very important part and both my husband and I were very much involved uh, with our three daughters. But remember, we had the advantage of not having a private practice. So there was the ability to negotiate, the ability to trade off, so that we were there for our family. The fact that th our three daughters are working women, two are physicians and one is an historian, shows that they did not think that uh, they were disadvantaged by having a working mother at a time when very few other people had a working mother. Well, that's really great. How many grandchildren do you have? We have six grandchildren. Wow. And it's, the, you know, the wonderful bumper s sticker which says, if I would have known that grandchildren were so fabulous, I would have had them first. <laughs> I'm there. I only have one grandchild, but I know exactly um, what you mean. My last question is um, oriented towards the future. I think maybe in describing the curriculum, I could see the spark in your eyes. That might, may be actually what you are most excited about in the future. But what's going to happen to cardiology? And can you, can you say a little about what you think this global medical community will look like, say, a decade from now? Well, I can't tell you about the global medical community, but I can tell you about something that I have just started at Emory after a number of preparatory discussions with university administrations. And we're going to examine women's heart health at Emory, but not solely as a medical problem. And we will be looking to do education and research and advocacy, but we're looking at this program to involve all the schools of the university, because women's health, heart health does not exist in a vacuum. And it involves business, it involves economics, it involves law and public policy and theology, et cetera. And we've had a few organizational meetings. And what we are trying to do is to develop an interdisciplinary. And by interdisciplinary, we mean involving at least two schools of the university program in women's heart health, where there will be a medical component. But we want to get people thinking about how important public policy and economics and religion and ethics are to women's cardiovascular health. And I expect this may be a microcosm of where we will have to go for health in general. I have chosen to do work in the area that has been my passion, which is women's heart health. But I think that I've probably enrolled a sizable number of individuals at Emory in my vision. And this is where we are likely to go in the next several years. 
So finally, any parting words of wisdom for young people looking at careers in cardiology now? Oh yes, I think the main issue is to follow your passion, to look at the unknown, not, not to be afraid of the unexplored areas, to step outside of your zone of comfort, because this is the way that you can define your own questions and begin to get the answers. And the, the, the problem is, is really leadership. And if you believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing and begin the investigation, you then become the leader in the area, the go-to person. And then it simply is enrolling other people in your vision and your imagination and exploring the unknown. There you have it. That's a great recipe for success. Thanks for taking the time with us. I know people will get a lot out of this interview. Okay. Thank you very much.